the Dead Sea. It's dead because all the water comes down and it has no place to go. It's 33% salt. That's why you float in it. The, the One of the most recognized and visited natural wonders is drying up faster than anyone can imagine. The Dead Sea is on a downward spiral and scientists say it could dry up completely in our lifetime. While this has devastating effects on the surrounding countries, a bigger problem is the emergence of sinkholes. As Sinkhole Alley, and the state of Florida is the sinkhole capital of America. So it's not surprising that you can get sinkholes in this city. Large portions of the road, parks, groves, and beaches have been closed to save human lives. And everyone is scratching their heads to come up with a solution before it is too late. Why is the Dead Sea drying up? What is emerging from the waterbed? And what are the implications for those whose lives are tied to it? Join us in this video as we explore why the Dead Sea has dried up and what is emerging from it. The Dead Sea is one of the most beautiful places on Earth, attracting millions of tourists every year from all over the world. Given its status as the lowest exposed spot on Earth, this unparalleled wonder of the world is known for the healing powers in its water, which is rich in minerals. Its therapeutic waters are so full of salt that bathers float right to the top. This natural spa is a source of rich minerals used by the ancient Egyptians for mummification. Now this world-famous natural wonder site is drying up, and sinkholes are appearing everywhere around it at a rate that scares and surprises scientists and ecologists. In the past 15 years, over 1,000 sinkholes have surfaced, causing tremendous crises for the area, which could lead to an environmental catastrophe. If you travel down to the Dead Sea today, you would notice these sinkholes pockmark the entire shoreline of the Jordanian and Israeli coasts. The Dead Sea is shrinking, and as it recedes, the freshwater aquifers along the perimeter of the lake are receding along with it. As this fresh water diffuses into salt deposits beneath the surface of the shoreline, the water slowly dissolves the deposits until the earth above collapses without warning. Over the past decade, Sinkholes have swallowed large portions of roads, date palm fields, and several buildings on the sea's northwest coast. This has led to many resorts, like the beachside resort at Ein Gedi, closing down operations. And according to environmental experts, many hotels along the shore are also in danger. The somewhat funny side to this story is that if you get swallowed by a sinkhole, it will be named after you. Another feature that has become observable due to the shrinking level of the Dead Sea is the creation of canyons. As the Dead Sea's water level falls, the creeks chase after their receding water. In doing so, they carve deeper into the salty soil, creating new canyons, some of them dozens of meters deep. The severity of the situation aside, the canyons and sinkholes make for an impressive prehistoric landscape. Even the most avowed critic and environmentalist can attest to the fact that the Dead Sea shoreline creates a visually stunning natural attraction that makes for beautiful photos. But the question is, why is the Dead Sea shrinking? Also, how severe is the situation with the creation of sinkholes and canyons? The Dead Sea was created millions of years ago from the same shift of tectonic plates that formed the Syrian-African Rift Valley. It was originally part of an ancient, much larger lake that reached out to the Sea of Galilee. They called this place the Sea of Miracles. However, its outlet to the sea evaporated above 18,000 years ago. This has created a salty residue in a desert basin at the lowest point on Earth, some 1,300 feet below sea level. Since then, this body of water, known as the Dead Sea since Greco-Roman times, has maintained its equilibrium and unique characteristics through a fragile natural cycle. The inflow of fresh water into the Dead Sea comes from rivers and streams from the surrounding mountains. It then loses the gained water by evaporation. This evaporation process, combined with its rich salt deposits, accounts for its unusual salinity, reaching up to 33%. This is higher than the Great Salt Lake in Utah, which reaches up to 27% salinity. This natural cycle has been maintained for hundreds of years. The cycle ensured that the flow of fresh water equaled the rate of evaporation, causing the dead sea water levels to hold steady. Things began to take a downward turn in the 1960s when Israel built an enormous pumping station on the banks of the Sea of Galilee. This pumping station began diverting water from the Upper Jordan, the Dead Sea's prime source, into a pipeline system that supplies water throughout the country. While this initiative was beneficial to the whole country, no one knew that it would come with devastating effects a few decades down the road. 
To make matters worse, in the 1970s, Jordan and Syria began diverting the Yarmouk, the lower Jordan River's main tributary. Since then, the Dead Sea has declined dramatically. It currently needs an annual inflow of about 160 billion gallons of water to maintain its current size, but it barely gets 10% of that. While the sea was about 50 miles long in 1950, it is currently just about 30 miles, a 40% drop in area in a single lifetime. Water levels are also falling at an average rate of 3 feet per year. According to a recent study released by the Israeli government, the rate of evaporation will slow, and the Dead Sea will reach equilibrium again in a few decades. But by then, it would have lost another third of its present volume. This grim picture would result in a massive loss for the many thousands who visit it every year and those whose livelihoods are tied to it. For many decades, tourists have flocked here to float in the brine, soak in mineral and mud baths, and take in the dramatic panorama of Israel's Judean desert and Jordan's Moab mountains. The Dead Sea's famed healing properties have also attracted individuals who suffer from chronic skin diseases, such as psoriasis and eczema. These individuals routinely make pilgrimages, attracted by the bone-dry climate and oxygen-rich atmosphere. Many visitors have claimed to be healed of their various diseases. From gas to the Dead Sea, it's known for its healing properties, helping those with chronic pain, arthritis, migraines, and anxiety, even helping to achieve better skin. Also, the Dead Sea region has been a refuge for thousands of years for messiahs, martyrs, and zealots, with locations sacred to Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Some Muslims believe that Moses, whom they regard as a prophet, lies buried in a hilltop mosque just off the main road from Jerusalem. Jesus Christ was said to have been baptized in the Jordan River after traveling down to the Dead Sea from Galilee. At the nearby fortress of Masada, nearly 1,000 Israelites committed suicide en masse in AD 73 rather than surrender to the Romans. The region was also the site where ascetics from Asia Minor in the 5th century retreated to and built monasteries such as Mar Saba, the oldest continuously inhabited monastery in the world. This area is also the region where the Dead Sea Scrolls, 2,000-year-old scrolls containing scriptures written in Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic, were located. Previously displayed as fragments of the Dead Sea Scrolls after an embarrassing discovery. While its name might suggest a lack of activity in life, the Dead Sea is far from this. It actually does support one of the world's most complex and vibrant ecosystems. Fed by freshwater springs and aquifers, around six oases along the shore harbor scores of indigenous species of plants, fish, and mammals, including ibex and leopards. Also, about 500 million birds, representing at least 300 species, including storks, pelicans, and honey buzzards, take refuge here during a biannual migration from Africa to Europe and back again. One of these oases is Ein Feshka, a lush expanse of tamarisk, papyrus, oleander, and pools of crystal water used by the late King Hussein of Jordan as a private playground in the 1950s and early 60s. All of these will be affected by the drop in the Dead Sea's water level. As the Dead Sea recedes, the springs that feed the oases will also disappear. In fact, many experts believe that Ein Feshka and other oases could wither away within five years. One of the reasons why the Dead Sea is shrinking, according to experts, is irrigation. In 1953, Israel constructed a dam, the Deganya Gate, a few hundred feet south of this spot, to collect water from the Sea of Galilee for the National Water Carrier Project. A network of pipes brought fresh water from the green north to the arid south, as well as to major cities on the coast. Syria and Jordan also began to take water from Jordan's tributaries, and in the mid-1990s, Jordan began receiving water from the Sea of Galilee under a peace treaty with Israel. The result was that the dam reduced the Jordan's flow to a trickle. Just about five miles south of the dam is the Degania Kibbutz, one of Israel's oldest kibbutzim, or agricultural cooperatives, founded in 1909. Meh, if you go down here, you will find yourself walking on dirt tracks through corn, tomato, and avocado fields along two massive giant metal pipes that pump water away from Jordan into Israel's extension irrigation system. Around this area, dozens of other collective farms draw their water from the river. A walk further down will reveal a small dam where the River Jordan comes to an end. From this dam, you'd see liquid flow through two emerging pipes down towards the riverbed. One of the pipes contains raw sewage flowing through the kibbutzim in the area. 
The other contains saline water from springs flowing into the Sea of Galilee, mixed with partially treated sewage from Tiberias, captured and removed to decrease the lake's salinity. And this means that where Jordan once flowed with fresh water down towards the Dead Sea, it is now replaced with a tenth of the original volume, but full of mostly sewage and saline water, not fresh water. Apart from irrigation, which diverts all the water away from the Dead Sea, Another reason for its shrinking water level is the water policy of the countries around it. According to environmentalists and various government officials, the water policies of Israel, Jordan, and Syria, which encourage unrestricted agricultural use, are to be blamed for the Dead Sea's slow death. For example, from the first few years of Israel's existence as a country, there was a generous bestowal of water subsidies on the nation's farmers. This came at a time when many parts of the nation were transformed into fertile vineyards and vegetable fields and assisted with aids from both the Labour and Likud governments. Today, however, agriculture accounts for just 3% of Israel's gross national product and uses up to half of its fresh water. Recently, Yuri Seigi, chairman of Israel's National Water Company, told a conference of Israeli farmers that a growing and irreversible gap between production and consumption looms. He warned that the water sources are being depleted without the deficit being restored. Jordan is no better, as it lavishes its water subsidies on its farmers with similar consequences. Every year, the kingdom takes about 71 billion gallons of water from the Yarmouk River and channels it into the King Abdullah Canal, constructed to provide irrigation for the Jordan Valley. Syria, on its part, takes out another 55 billion gallons of water every year. The result of these withdrawals is that the main source of water for Lower Jordan, and by extension, the Dead Sea, is at near total depletion. Another example of this regressive water policy is found in the Ein Gedi Nature Reserve. Here, you'd find a stream of fresh water rushing through a steep canyon and originating in an underground spring. This fresh water source, a little over 100 million gallons a year, unfortunately, doesn't reach the Dead Sea. Just outside the Nature Reserve, the Ein Gedi Kibbutz takes it, bottles it for a popular brand of mineral water, and uses the rest to irrigate the kibbutz grounds and botanical gardens. For many environmentalists, this kibbutz policy is sheer hypocrisy. They say that the people of the Ein Gedi kibbutz are the first to complain about sinkholes along the shore, but will not take responsibility for contributing to the problem. Unsurprisingly, the Ein Gedi's residents deny any responsibility for what is going on at the Dead Sea. This came in response to comments from certain green groups like Friends of the Earth and the Israeli Parliament, which recently sought to crack down on the kibbutz's water usage. According to Mayor of Ayalon, and Gedi's spokesperson, it's garbage what they're saying. If you take all the water from Angedi's spring, it's a small drop in the Dead Sea. The problem isn't us, it's the Israeli government. Ayalon blames the Water Commission and the Agriculture Ministry for a short-sighted policy that, she says, has wrecked the local economy. Our date palms are dying because of the sinkholes, she says. She continues by saying, Our farmers can't work in some groves because it's gotten too dangerous. People have come close to being killed. We almost had to close the kibbutz, and the government did nothing. It has no policy to save the Dead Sea. So, what is the answer to the ongoing water crisis? Environmental activists say that one solution is to eliminate the water subsidies. According to Raed Daoud, managing director of EcoConsult, a water use consulting firm, unless the water is priced at its real cost, there's no way you're going to reduce agriculture. But this has proven impossible to achieve, given that the region's agricultural lobby is strong and the environmental movement weak. This sentiment was echoed by Israel's water commissioner, Shimon Tal, when he spoke publicly about the need to reduce some subsidies. He, however, admitted that it would be a long and difficult battle. To win the race against time to save the Dead Sea, and by extension, the whole region, Tamar Keenan, former Israeli Water Commission official, says, We desperately need to change the situation, but the agriculture lobby won't even talk about it. Another suggestion is to encourage the use of alternative water sources. One environmentally conscious group championing this approach is Friends of the Earth Middle East. Friends of the Earth Middle East is part of a coalition of 21 environmental groups that have developed proposals to conserve household water use. According to them, this is about 133 billion gallons a year, as much as that used in agriculture. They also seek to regulate the amount that can be taken out of Israel's springs. 
In addition, the Israeli government is actively involved in the building of wastewater treatment plants and desalination facilities. But beyond all of these efforts, sinkholes are appearing faster than ever in this region. From the mineral beach, you can see dozens of holes lining up your view. In some places, large holes have merged, leading to the collapse of an entire area. Some of the sinkholes have also been filled up with green gray water. As Sinkhole Alley, and the state of Florida is the sinkhole capital of America. So it's not surprising that you can get sinkholes in this city. On one side of the road from the beach is an overnight parking lot that was the first location to be closed when the sinkholes appeared. The parking lot now looks like a set for a war movie, full of old props, including large craters, shattered buildings that collapsed into sinkholes, dead trees, pipes, and cables hanging in midair. The first sinkhole surfaced in the Neva Zohar area in the 1980s and was treated as a geological curiosity anomaly. This was because no one had any reason to worry. Prior to that time, all everyone had to deal with was the dropping sea level, and it wasn't even regarded as a problem. It was seen as part of the experience. In fact, beach operators got accustomed to it and considered it part of the routine. Lifeguard towers had wheels attached so they could be moved forward every year. New steps were also constructed from time to time and access pathways were extended. But by the end of the 1990s, the sinkholes had turned into a big problem. From date groves to overnight parking lots near Ein Gedi, sinkholes were appearing faster than they could be predicted. In 1996, the number of sinkholes was around 220. But by 2006, in just 10 years, the number had skyrocketed to 1,808. Right now, there are over 6,000 sinkholes around the Dead Sea region. Although sinkholes are a well-known phenomenon around the world, the rate and intensity of their appearance here are unparalleled. According to Dr. Gideon Baer, head of the GSI unit that studies and monitors the Dead Sea, about 500 sinkholes open up every year. The question then is, what will the Dead Sea shoreline look like in 20 years? Barring a multi-billion dollar infrastructure plan to address the issues of irrigation, desalination and artificial refilling of the Dead Sea, it is relatively easy to guess what will happen. It is a given fact that the water level of the Dead Sea will continue to drop, falling an estimated 25 meters below its current level by 2036. Thousands or even tens of thousands of new sinkholes will have appeared while existing ones will get larger. These will irreversibly change the landscape along the Dead Sea's western coast. In many places, they will link up and lead to widespread collapse. The shoreline will become less and less accessible. Any tourist who wishes to swim will have to settle for the southern basin, as is the case today, in industrial ponds close to local hotels or artificial lagoons. In the absence of an innovative, massive infrastructure project, only daredevils in top physical condition will be able to reach the natural shoreline. However, there are ambitious proposals to replace some of the water lost from the Jordan River and slow or even reverse the decline of the Dead Sea. A plan backed by the World Bank, the Red to Dead project, would see waste brine from a new desalination plant at the Jordanian port of Aqaba pumped north into the Dead Sea. This plan, however, would only work if it doesn't cause major changes, according to Itai Gavrieli, an Israeli geologist who was an advisor on the project's impact. He says the change should be one that will not dilute the lake, that will not trigger biological blooming in the lake, or major precipitation of minerals that may whiten the surface of the lake. Although the plan is an ambitious one, it is a very expensive solution that also seems to ignore the root causes of the Dead Sea's decline. Another issue that can hinder the plan is the lack of a final peace settlement between Israel and the Palestinians and the deteriorating relations between Israel and Jordan. And with the recent outbreak of war, no one knows when or if anything can be done on the project. In retrospect, it might have been unwise to stop the Jordan River from entering the Dead Sea, according to Dr. Karmit Ish Shalom. According to her, if our children say they want to save it, they can't even do it because it's too late. Everything that's happening here, it's because of us. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos like this one.